nothing is true. Nothing is true. Everything, everything, everything is permitted. Everything is permitted. Is permitted. points that he that he did take an activist stance went all the way I mean absolutely all the way to the extreme limits of reformism of the period and the anarchists of course claim Thoreau as an ancestor and I think they're quite right to do so so was this uh, this has been presented in my uh, uh, small readings on Brook Farm uh, the 1830s have been presented as a uh, as uh, the whole reform, I guess, uh, as uh, a reaction to the increasing um, industrialization and businessification, businessification, if I can coin such a horrible word, of America. Yeah. Were there, is this true, and are there other factors involved that uh, there are all sorts? That you I mean, like it, to... there's never a single explanation for any of these things. It's interesting to note that H.G. Uh, Wells once said somewhere, I wish I could track this down, that the uh, the first superfluous human being was born in 1830. And he was referring to indust the Industrial right. Revolution, and the fact that that uh, that universal labor, in fact, created you know universal unemployment. Surplus but it's, it 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 has sort of a more metaphysical spin on it too, and I think a lot of the reform movement was reacting, consciously or unconsciously, to that. But there was more to it than that. There was the whole what we've been talking about, the whole tradition in America, if if one can use such a word. Of, uh, of radicalism that goes back to uh, the Protestant uh, Revolution and even before that to the uh, 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 to pre-Protestant heretical religious movements that that sparked off uh, political uh, political events and from let's say from the 13th century on in Europe the peasants revolts and what have you but especially goes back to the uh, 1640s and the Protestant uh, Revolution. So America was the place where all those ideas went when they were kicked out of Europe. I mean, this is a vast oversimplification, okay. but uh, but every virtually everyone who came to America, with the exception of the sheer exploitative profiteers uh, of the Virginia Company and what have you, everybody else was a radical of one sort or another, and. Uh, Come on, 1830s is only, I mean, there were still people alive who remembered the Whiskey Rebellion, who remembered the, uh, the, the American Revolution. There were old granddads around when, when a Stephen Pearl Andrews was a young youngster growing up who would have told him about the great tradition, the great, by then already, an American tradition of resistance to authority. So uh, it isn't just the rise of the industrial age. You could say it's the rise of capitalism itself, but in order to trace that, we have to go back at least to the 13th century. You know. All right, let, let's talk a little, if we could, about the Civil War and then go back to the, these individual people who, okay. whose lifespan uh, go through it and before it and after it. Now, the Civil War, uh, I get the vague impression, was looked upon, especially in Europe, uh, there must have been volunteers who came to uh, fight in America's Civil War. Plenty. Uh, it was looked upon as a um, a great ba a great uh, cause, almost like the well, I don't want to profane it, like the Spanish Civil War of the 1940s. But I do remember reading now that uh, I don't know, if not many people, not it isn't well known that certain Irish immigrants of the period were landed in New York, sent by train to I think Grand Island in Detroit, in the Detroit region put on an island and immediately inducted into the Union Army. And uh, uh, we were always so taught... The Irish fought on both sides. Well, so did the Jews. But... Um, so did blacks. But they, were, they had no choice. Blacks they fought had, on both yeah, sides. They had no See, choice. See, this is the point. In retrospect, with, they were the with the wisdom of hindsight, with a kind of PBS bullshit view of the Civil War, is that uh, blacks, of course, only, would, only fought for the South. People, or for the North, rather. 
that people of, of goodwill, you know, only fought for the North, that the South was, was wicked. I mean, even the fact that, that the one I'm, you know, the program I'm talking about that was on Channel 13, yeah. at least they allowed a few Southern voices to be heard, but still this kind of Manichaean view of the Civil War, South evil, North good, you know. Now, I'm perfectly willing to admit that the South was evil. I'm not willing to admit the, that the North was good. Well, and neither were a lot of, of the reform theorists well, here, around at the, at the time. I accept the Marxist analysis, which was uh, that it was a war between Northern capital and Southern uh, plantation economy uh, for yeah, control sure. of the, uh, the future of the United States. This was not unapparent to some people, some of the smarter heads around at the time. Uh, um, Lysander Spooner, for example, who was one of the first in individualist anarchists in America, refused to support either side in the Civil War because he said even though he was against slavery, he was for secession. He thought that anyone should be allowed to secede from anything and that that was clearly the American, uh, the, what, what the, the founding fathers in his mind had intended. So he found himself unable to, he found evil on both sides, if you want to use a word like evil. So, um, and in fact, as, as we, as, I mean, more and more revisionist hist history is being done on this, uh, slavery was not abolished in Maryland and Delaware and the border states until about a year and a half into the war, if I'm not mistaken. 63. Yeah. And uh, Lincoln himself was a vicious racist, and his speeches in, in southern Illinois as opposed to his speeches in northern Illinois, he said some of the most remarkably anti-black sentiments that you could that you could that you could ever hope to hear from a Ku Klux Klan uh, leader. Collected and printed. They they probably have been by 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 some uh, you know right-wing bigot in the South. I mean, this is the unfortunate thing is that everyone is writing history the way they want history to have been, and uh, I suppose you know even 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 or perhaps especially we do this also. But I think that it's now time for a reassessment of the Civil War as the first major organizing operation of industrial capitalism in the New World, uh, rather than this great idea of uh, this crusade to free the slaves, which it was not. It was most decidedly yeah. not. Not in Lincoln's eyes, not in the eyes of like, the like South, not in the eyes of Europe, not in the eyes of the theoretical reformers. Uh, no one believed it was that until way along, you know, until even after the war, or let's say in the last years, the last like, year. Like a lot of other war, great wars, it, it became the beginning of uh, industrial uh, and economic uh, revolutions of great uh, strength. It did, but it, in, in look I mean, from another point of view. Expansion, not revolution. Expansion, yeah. yeah. It put the kibosh on, on, uh, on the radical movement for 20 years. Yeah. It's not until the 1880s that you start to get a, a, a coherent radical movement. In but the, the uh, for instance, even in, uh, world, the Korean War supposedly created the Japanese uh, uh, industrial miracle. This is because, what war is for. Because, war uh, is the health of the state. The products were manufactured that they needed. With, instead of making little paper dolls, they started to make uh, small munitions. Sure, and so absolutely. You can you can boost boost the product and boost uh, the productivity. And World and War One uh, saw the creation <laughs> of uh, refrigeration for the transport transportation of food and so on. They were all great in every, technical. Every war leads to major technical breakthroughs. Right. Even the the Gulf War, you know. A miserable uh, two-bit spectacle uh, sitcom that it was, from the point of view of America, not of course not the point of view of yeah. the uh, 100, 200,000 Iraqis who got smushed, but uh, even 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 that led to uh, technological breakthroughs. Oh, right. goody goody! Yeah. It's like somebody you know, one of some yuppie uh, heard quoted said, "Hate the war, love the tech." You know. Yeah, like and the whole the whole space exploration was based on uh, the Cold War. Yeah. And that's the reason why the space uh, space didn't su didn't succeed. It's why we're not in space is because it turned out not to have all that interesting military applications. Could we go back and pick up some of these? Uh, so anyway, I just want to say to me, the Civil War has to be looked at from one point of view as a betrayal, a conscious betrayal, or repression would be a better word, of what of a reform movement that in fact threatened to succeed. If you, if you really go back and look what was going on in the 1840s and 50s in this country, these people were very close to success. 
Mm -hmm. uh, at least in at least in New England and New York and in, in the uh, nearer part of the Midwest, at least in that part of the country, the Yankee heartland, if you want to look at it that way, um, these movements, Fourierism and uh, Owenism and uh, uh, abolitionism and radical Protestant, you know, come outism as they called it, to the come out of the organized churches and this move perfectionism, the movement of the spirit. These things were, they had swept up even, you can read about it, even very simple farming communities. The villages around Brook Farm, you know, West Roxbury and so forth, where these New England farmers were sitting around reading Plato and, and, and even, you know, Rumi and Hafez and stuff that they had heard about from, from Emerson. So we have the war then as being a conscious or unconscious uh, movement of the major society to crush, uh, to take all the, absorb all That's the right, energy. absorb all that energy, put it all into this kind of spectacular abolitionism. Yeah, yeah. And, and finding an Same enemy. thing happened to the women's movement, not, not, to, uh, not, not to keep on harping on the abolitionist theme. Uh, when Victoria Woodhull and those people were around talking about the women's movement, they were far in advance of most of the feminists today in their radicalism and in their of the situation. After the Civil War, what had the women's movement become in this country? Nursing. Women's suffrage. Votes for women. But wasn't also the uh, uh, pe women were were told to give up their aims? Yes, in order to Support abolitionism. Yes, that that was first, and then that they were the first comment. then they were told to give up their aims in order to support the vote for women. Right. Well, so. all during World War II, the, there was a no strike uh, pledge in American labor. Uh, in other words, that's exactly the, the right. That's the, that's uh, what most forget know, about the, the class war. Forget the class war. No records uh, produced. Hmm. Instead of London, uh, Lenin's wonderful slogan, "Turn the uh, imperialist war into a class war," and we had turned the class war into an imperialist war. I yep. We had. Yep. And it's always going to be that way if governments are running the wars. Well, I mean, we're, the, the, we're theory, the theory, here, the theory uh, is that then if a revolutionary party runs the war, it'll be different. Well, you know, well, well, we're I would say that here. unfortunately history has no evidence to prove this. Should we, uh, in, the, in the five minutes left to us, can we take one of these people as a sort of a typical 19th century anarchist and, 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 and take him through his life? Benjamin Tucker. Well, uh, mm -hmm. actually, the, probably the least known but most interesting would be Stephen Pearl Andrews, uh, because in his life he went through the, he went through them all. He had a long. Could you long talk life. about him for it? He point? started as a radical abolitionist. Uh, he was, um, you know, from a New England uh, minor gentry family. Uh, had a good education. Ended up in Texas. Got involved in the uh, abolitionist movement in a big way, um, and was actually. Uh, escaped from Texas just in front of the tar and feathers and uh, made it to New York where he spent the rest of his life. He was a very eccentric individual, very well beloved. Um, I would say he was probably, in a way, he was sort of New York City's one of the first bohemians. Because, what, are, what are his dates? Oh, golly. Well, he, he's, he's, his active dates of activity would span the late would spend the late 40s up to the 1880s. And uh, you say modern times, th was this a, a Well, let me go uh, on, let me give you a right, go okay. on with the thumbnail sketch here. So in New York, he got involved in every single reform movement that you can think of, including some that he made especially his own, like um, universal language. He invented a universal language called Alwato, which is a, a precursor of Esperanto. I have a book on El Wato. I intend to be the only one of the few people. In El Wato or well, on El Wato? It was, it's the book that Andrews did on El Wato, and it has a vocabulary list, and I intend to start using it soon. So, so <laughs> anyway, um, he also brought Pittman shorthand to America. It was one of the few, th few things he succeeded at, because he thought it would, be, uh, he thought it would, would, would uh, help the poor to become literate. He was wrong. It got taken up by business instead. But such as such, these things often happen with the more successful reform ideas. They get removed from the matrix of radicalism and used by, by the conspiracy. So he he then went on to support women's rights and to help Victoria Woodhull run for president. He was into uh, uh, he continued to be an active abolitionist up through the, through the Civil War. 
He was um, an anarchist under the became an anarchist under the influence of Josiah Warren, and then uh, the two of them together founded Modern Times in Brentwood, Long Island, what is now Brentwood, uh, which was one of the most successful and long-lived of the 19th century communes, and one of the very few pure anarchist communes where there was no control and no system whatsoever except for Warren's uh, labor and notes. What was the economy based on? Warren's labor notes. Oh, you mean what did they do to make yeah. money? Yeah. So uh, this is a little unclear. They farmed, they had some, some light industry, um, public things were published there. The chances are that people were bringing in money from other sources. How long uh, did it last? Hmm? How long, How long did, did it last? I, I, unfortunately, I, I, the dates are not on the tip of my tongue, but it, it, it had a good run for its money. And even after it broke up as a commune, a lot of the families stayed there. And uh, in fact, uh, Pearl Andrews, when he died in the 1880s, died in Brentwood uh, and, uh, uh, in the home. What of is it? What are the former. title of some of his? Uh, did he write? Yeah, he wrote a, his his most famous book is called Science and Society. Um, That's the name of the Kami Journal. Yeah. Do you they, think they, they took it from They him? may have. He also, he also, later in life, invented a system which he called universology, which was going to incorporate all knowledge. And it was, all, it was also, it had a political aspect called the Pantarchy. And he, he proclaimed himself the grand Pantarch of the universe. At this time, Andrews he was, was getting, pope, then, huh? getting a little, yes, he was a kind of a pope. A kind he of did a, that without any humor? Uh, I'm afraid to say that, that <laughs> one thing Andrews did not have was a sense of humor. But he's, I really love him. He's a dear, dear fellow. And, and, and Pantarchy was not an authoritarian system. The, he was only the Pantarch because, you know, he was the only one who could explain it to everybody see, else. Okay. And he was actually very, very anarchistic and uh, 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 free-spirited kind of guy. In fact, got in a lot of trouble for his anarchism. Okay, next, uh, I think we'll have to get to free love in the next... Uh... Hi. How are you, darling? Oh, uh, hot. It's uh, still July, right? <laughs> Okay, in that, in that same year, 1959, uh, the Beatitude magazine was found. Many beat hobbyists that were beginning to uh, come to the surface. And to uh, say more about that is Peter Lambert Wilson. Well, nobody told me this was going to be an evening devoted to irony. <laughs> so uh, they, uh, they tricked me. I wrote, I wrote something quite serious about the crimes of the beats, crimes of the beats and uh, silly oriental religions. <laughs> Remember beat zen? The idea, as I recall it, was to eliminate all pea-brained, pious orthodoxy, ethnic exclusiveness from zen, retaining only its taste of suddenness, insightfulness, mental freedom and attentiveness, rowdy humor and dada spirituality. This taste, it was believed, might prove compatible with natural but repressed new world tendencies toward nature worship, anarchism, or at least disrespect for pompous authority, and a kind of folk surrealism that pervades our good old collective narrative, a quality known at the time as holy goofiness. Now, as it turned out, according to the principle Zen mind, beginner's mind, this naive, native, fresh-minted version of an ancient teaching proved to be quite brilliant. This impure and foolish misunderstanding on the part of a few ill-informed barbarians was actually the moment of the transmission of the Dharma and the very salvation of a moribund faith. By dumping centuries of rotten accretions of monkish pride, upper-class violence, moralism, reaction, and bad consciousness, the unwitting beats had carried out the one and only operation capable of making Buddhism or any other ancient or oriental tradition useful to us here and now. They made it new by radically re-envisioning it and even reinventing it on the basis of a couple of paperback translations and a series of sudden insights probably fueled more by marijuana than meditation. <laughs> I wanted to be funny about this, but actually what happened next simply makes one sad. 
a host of tired old Europeans and Asians, attracted by the spiritual energy of America in the 1950s and 60s, told us that our clever inventions, beat Zen, etc., proved our native talent, but that we should forget about it all now and buy the real thing, orthodox mystical tradition, instead. From them, of course. <laughs> because to go herring off into the world of the spirit with no master was dangerous and heretical. We were bound to come to grief if we kept it up. Instead, we should strive to become old and tired like them <laughs> through much self-repression, self-delusion, and self-debasement. They called it spiritual discipline in their tradition. We Americans are painfully self-conscious about our lack of background. Some of us react by becoming narrow-minded, bigoted, patriotic believers, while others are all too prone to fall for any form of authority, provided it's exotic or certifiably ancient. So we signed up in the armies of Orthodox, Sufism, Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever, the Dumbos got taken for rides by various Maharishis and fat kids from India, while the smart ones held out for authentic tired old bourgeois. Years later, it turned out that many of the European and Asian masters and their New World imitators were in the game for money, or sex, or power. For them, naturally, not for their disciples. And enlightenment wasn't all it was cracked up to be either. It didn't even improve the personality, much less cure AIDS. Enlightened people turned out to be just as vulnerable to being human as the next poor slob. Or worse, they sometimes came to believe their enlightenment freed them from any obligation to act decently toward their spiritual inferiors. So if the Beats committed any crime in their discovery of the exotic Orient, the fault lay in their own distrust of themselves. Like all revolutionaries, they failed to go far enough in the logical ramifications of their own actions. By inventing Beat Zen, they had, right at the beginning, attained enlightenment. What needed to be carried out afterwards was the far more difficult task of constructing an entire new culture on the basis of that initial flash of the spirit. Instead, all we have are a few remnants of a forgotten moment of genuine brilliance, while the beats themselves mostly either died young or converted to some orthodoxy or another. It's not too late, or so I feel. We've had 20 or 30 years of the guru princip and seen that it doesn't work either. But some of us are still alive and still capable of thought, albeit less cloudless thought than in 1959. <laughs> I suggest we carry on as we started and finish the looting and pillaging of the great old traditions and the imaginal creation of our own tailor-made heresies or even new revelations. I suggest we go back to the moment when we were stupid enough to believe in our own creative spirit. Back to beat Zen. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed the show. Oh, we enjoyed being there and uh, taping it, and uh, it was really like it was really like a party, a party in your pants. No, a party in your living room. Uh, we'll be back again next week with more of the show. And uh, in the time left, uh, I want you folks to remember that this is nothing new, and it's continuing now. It has different names. It was a Greenwich Village in the 20s. It was called Bohemianism. And bohemianism, I think, can be traced back, if you like. The term itself goes back to the um, University of Paris, the Sorbonne, in the 14th century. I don't know which century. Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, the most rowdy students, and they were all rowdy, but the rowdiest of the rowdy came from uh, the Czech lands, from Bohemia. And that term stuck, and... Um, when the patronage dropped out, as, uh, when, when the feudal society broke up, when patronage dropped out and the poor bourgeois artists, artists in the bourgeois society, had to fend for themselves. In the 1814s, you had Henri Merger, who wrote La Vie de Bohème, which became the wonderful opera, the only opera I've ever seen, La Bohème. 
He earned his money, guess what, doing during the day. His day job, he never quit it. Well, he did after a while. He was a fucking advertising man writing uh, for, a, uh, for a trade journal of the millinery trade. Uh, Paris was the world center of the millinery trade. And uh, once he got his big hit, he quit and uh, started writing full time. But um, maybe he should have kept his day job. And this kind of travail has been going on unto this very day. Very few of you know it, but uh, I used to have a day job too. But uh, today, uh, I'm a retired humorist. So, um, tune in next week for some more fun and cookies. No cookies, because that has sugar. Um, uh, more fun and sex. See you then. Oh, Jesus, are we still on camera? Oh, I, I have a fly on my nose. Ugh. The whole... It is no more than two steps to the door of the friend. You are stopping with the first step. Nothing is true. Nothing is everything is permitted. It is no more than two steps to the door of the friend. You are stopping with the first step. Nothing is true. Nothing is Everything true. Everything is true. Everything is permitted. Everything is permitted.